Hi, my name is Lawrence Jay, and I'm the director at Rolling Ridge, and I welcome you to our second event in our Divine Friendship series, where we are exploring the Christian contemplative classics. Today, we are looking at The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, led by Alan Dillingham, our resident professor on these Christian contemplative classics. The idea of divine friendships looks at our relationship with God in three different ways. The first one, recognizing that the original divine friendship begins within the Trinity itself, between Father, Son, and Spirit. The second aspect of divine friendships looks at God's relationship with us. And the third aspect of divine friendships looks at our relationship with others because of Christ in the center. We hope that through this exploration of the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, you will grow deeper in your understanding of the divine friendships in your life. We welcome you to this time, and we hope that you will be blessed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I've got to turn on my... Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for your interest. Um, if you, uh, as I was uh, saying earlier, if you haven't heard of Thomas Akempis, uh, don't feel bad. That's the way that he wanted it. Uh, he uh, lived from 1380 to 1471 and spent most of his time in a Dutch monastery uh, copying Bibles. Uh, and initially, the imitation of Christ, which is the work that he is known for, uh, was, uh, well, initially it wasn't published, it was sort of handed on, and when it was published first, it was anonymous, um, so it was only later on that they sort of found, oh, this is the guy who had done it, um, but we really don't know a whole lot about him other than what he's left in his writings, which Again, as I said, he probably would have uh, would have wanted it that way because, in one sense, the main thrust of the imitation of Christ is contained in a quote that he has in Book Three, Chapter Thirteen, which says, uh, "There is no enemy more wicked or troublesome to the soul than yourself." when you are not in harmony with the spirit. Uh, so I, wanna, I want you to bear that in mind as we go forward. Uh, the imitation is divided into four books. Uh, the first book is, uh, focuses on withdrawing from the outside world and recommends silence and solitude to focus on the spiritual life. Uh, it, the, the imitation was meant uh, primarily for uh, people in religious orders, but it became very popular uh, in lay circles too. And actually Thomas More, who was mentioned earlier before the program started, was uh, one of the ones who was very familiar uh, with the imitation of Christ. So book one counseled silence and solitude. Uh, book two continues the themes of book one, and it also cautions against trying to avoid adversity. adversity. Uh, it said instead of trying to avoid adversity, uh, it should be welcome. And it, uh, in the second book, it recommends the cross as the royal road to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, book three is the longest book in the imitation. And uh, it takes the form of an imagined conversation between the disciple and Jesus. So there are parts, it's written like a screenplay almost. There's parts where the disciple speaks, and then there's parts where Christ speaks. And it's, uh, they're very long passages, uh, many of them. So uh, they should be seen more as a, uh, more as an imaginative dialogue than, than a revelation. Uh, however, you know, when you, when you judge the fruits of, of the dialogue, I think uh, you, would, you would have to come to the conclusion that it's, 
uh, divinely inspired at the least. Uh, book four is the shorter, shortest book, and it continues the dialogue between Jesus and the disciple, and it focuses on the union between the two. Uh, uh, as I said in book one, uh, Thomas advises turning away from material interests, from worries about success and failure, and from depending on fellow creatures rather than on God. Uh, he indicates that relying primarily on one's reason and one's own ability rather than relying on the transforming grace of Jesus will actually slow your progress in the spiritual life and may actually lead you away from developing wisdom. So wisdom for Thomas Akempis uh, in terms of book learning wasn't to be highly valued if it didn't, uh, if it didn't lead to humility. Uh, that was sort of the key for Thomas Akempis, humility, humility, humility. Um, Thomas advises in book one that happiness will be found only when one turns to God. Uh, to do this, the disciple must turn away from the world and from himself or herself. Uh, worldly pursuits, uh, including the pursuit of knowledge, uh, are vain if they don't lead to humility. Solitude and silence are to be preferred in Thomas's view to sociability. He wasn't a social butterfly. He didn't, uh, uh, he didn't encourage uh, friendships between people as much as he did friendship uh, with Jesus. So it's kind of a, uh, in some ways it's an ascetical and austere uh, approach. Uh, comfort should be sought from God and not from fellow human beings. And as Thomas writes, there can be no complete security nor perfect peace in this life. And that's from book one, chapter 12. Uh, one must regard oneself as an exile and a pilgrim on the earth if one wants to achieve stability and grow in grace. Uh, one should depend on grace more than wisdom and put their trust in God rather than their own intelligence. As Thomas writes, man proposes, but God disposes, and man's destiny is not in his own hands. Uh, that's from book one, chapter 19. Uh, Thomas recommends patient endurance of the world's contempt and contradictions, and indeed, sees them as opportunities uh, for grace. Uh, so book one, mostly about withdrawal, solitude, relying on God. Uh, again, he was a monk, so he sort of favors that type of uh, monastic uh, approach. Uh, in book two, Thomas says that the disciples should seek humility, and forbearance of wrongs rather than the absence of adversity. Uh, he has a quote from book two, chapter three, which is, which is in your handouts. Uh, he who knows the secret of endurance will enjoy the greatest peace. Such a one is conqueror of self, master of the world, a friend of Christ, and an heir of heaven. Uh, Thomas emphasizes friendship with Jesus above all things, again, because he says the love of creatures is deceptive and unstable. Love him, therefore, he writes, and keep him as your friend, for when all others desert you, he will not abandon you, nor allow you to perish at the last. From book two, chapter seven. Thomas goes on to write that if Jesus is not your best friend, you will be exceedingly sad and lonely. Book two, chapter eight. Thomas calls Jesus the best and most faithful of friends. 
And Thomas assures the disciple that if he seeks Jesus in all things, he will find him. But if he, but if he seeks only himself, uh, he will find only his ruin. Uh, and again, a quote from book two, chapter seven, for a man who does not seek Jesus does himself greater hurt than the whole world and all his enemies could ever do him. Uh, Thomas, Thomas goes on to say that one cannot love Christ without loving his cross. And Thomas call, calls the cross the royal road to the kingdom of God. And the point here is not a type of masochism or suffering for suffering's sake, but to take comfort in affliction and to take comfort in adversity. And there's a fairly long uh, passage in chapter 12 of book two that I have excerpts from, uh, from, the, uh, from a handout, and I'll see if I can't call that on my screen for you as I read through it. Uh-oh. Okay. okay, does everyone does everyone see the handout on the screen? Yes. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we see it. Okay. Yeah, Thomas writes in book 12. Uh, in the cross is salvation. In the cross is life. In the cross is protection against our enemies. In the cross is infusion of heavenly sweetness. In the cross is strength of mind. In the cross is joy of spirit. In the cross is excellence of virtue. In the cross is perfection of holiness. There is no other way to life and to true inner peace in the way of the cross and of daily self-denial. Go where you will, seek what you will. You will find no higher way above nor safer way below than the road of the Holy Cross. The cross always stands ready and everywhere awaits you. You cannot escape it wherever you flee for wherever you go, you bear yourself and always find yourself. Look up or down, without you or within, and everywhere you will find the cross. If you cast away one cross, you will certainly find another, and perhaps a heavier. So long as suffering is grievous to you and you seek to escape it, so long will it go ill with you, for the trouble you try to escape will pursue you everywhere. Uh, so that's his passage on the Royal Road of the Cross. Uh, moving into book three, he discusses love and how love makes it all in a sense, uh, worthwhile. And continuing there, there's uh, a couple of passages that, I, that I'll read too. Uh, love is a mighty power, a great and complete good. Love alone lightens every burden and makes the rough places smooth. It bears every hardship as though it were nothing and renders all bitterness sweet and acceptable. The love of Jesus is noble and inspires us to great deeds. Nothing is sweeter than love, nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing wider, nothing more pleasant, nothing fuller or better in heaven or earth. For love is born of God and can rest only in God above all created things. Love flies, runs, and leaps for joy. It is free and unrestrained. Love gives all for all. 
resting in one who is highest above all things, from whom every good flows and proceeds. Love does not regard the gifts, but turns to the giver of all good gifts. Love knows no limits, but ardently transcends all bounds. Love feels no burden, takes no account of toil, attempt things beyond its strength. Love sees nothing as impossible, for it feels able to achieve all things. Love therefore does great things. It is strange and effective, while he who lacks love faints and fails. From book three, chapter five. And I'm going to move from the uh, handout back to my talk, but you can, if you have the handout, you can continue to follow. There are shorter passages there from Thomas uh, that I will be referring to. Uh, as I said before, book three uh, takes the form of a dialogue between Jesus and the disciple. Uh, seeking Jesus rather than self is repeated in over and over again in this dialogue. When we are absorbed with ourselves, we tend to get in our own way. We come, become discouraged, desolate, and frustrated. Desiring any glory outside of God will not bring true joy. Those obsessed with self-interest and self-love are slaves of their own desires. The disciple observes, whereas by, and this is a quote from book three, chapter eight, whereas by perverse self-love, I had lost myself, now by lovingly seeking you alone, I have found both myself and you. In this dialogue that occurs in book three, Jesus encourages the disciple to communicate with him. Um, Christ says in the dialogue uh, from book two, chapter 11, uh, take care therefore not to rely over much on any preconceived desire without asking my counsel, lest you regret or become displeased at what first pleased you and for which you were eager. Christ goes on to counsel in this dialogue that slowness in turning to him is the greatest obstacle to receiving his comfort. From book three, chapter 30, for when you should earnestly seek me, you first turn to many other comforts and hope to restore yourself by worldly means. It is only when all these things have failed that you remember that I am the savior of all who put their trust in me. Love the giver more than the gift, Christ admonishes, and follow his example of humility. I became the humblest and least of all men that you might overcome your pride through my humility. Book two, chapter 13. Jesus tells the disciple, choose this simple counsel of perfection. Forsake all and you shall find all. Book two, chapter 32. I'm sorry, book three, chapter 32. Give all for all, look for nothing, ask for nothing in return, Rest purely and trustingly in me, and you shall possess me. In book three, chapter 37. The dialogue between Christ and the disciple continues in book four, where Jesus declares, whatever you offer to me besides yourself, I account as nothing. I seek not your gift, but yourself. Book four, chapter eight. I will supply what is ever, whatever is lacking in you. 
Come therefore and receive me. Book four, chapter 12. And I'm going to end by going back, going back to the handout. Okay. And it's the very last quote there. Uh, Whoever therefore raises his intent to God with a pure heart and disengages himself from all inordinate love or hatred of any creature shall best be prepared to receive grace and be worthy of the gift of devotion. For our Lord bestows his blessings where he finds vessels empty to receive them. And the more completely a man renounces worldly things, and the more perfectly he dies to self by the conquest of self, the sooner will grace be given, the more richly will it be infused, and the nearer to God will it raise the hearts set free from the world. And that's sort of a Reader's Digest version, if you will, of the imitation of Christ. I followed uh, lots of quotes from Thomas Akempis because he seemed to say a lot of things much better than I could paraphrase. <laughs> uh, and having the, uh, the handouts gives you a reference. We sort of covered a lot of heavy territory in a very short space. Uh, so what I suggest that we do now is that uh, we take two or three minutes just to reflect in silence, and then we can come back and open up the discussion on anything you've heard or read from the, the handout or anything you, any reactions you have uh, to the imitation of Christ. Uh, so we'll uh, begin now and I'll let us, I'll um, let you know when the period of silence ends. Thank you.
Okay, um, I'd like to open it up now to anyone uh, who has uh, reactions, uh, comments, thoughts, um, how, uh, how this sort of brief dipping into the imitation of Christ um, affected you? Uh, were there parts that you liked, parts that you just strongly disagree with? Um, I invite you to, uh, the floor, the, the floor is open. Uh, this is uh, Mary Beth, and I actually have more of a question, Alan and others. Um, sure. What do you think uh, Thomas Kempis means by the secret of endurance? You know, I was just interested in how he uses the words endurance and the cross. Um, mm -hmm. And just curious what your thoughts are on, on that. Um, well, I, from my from my reading of the imitation of Christ, the idea is that adversity should be endured rather than avoided. That um, that in 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 the spiritual life, one should not be running from the cross, but should be accepting the cross. Uh, and that's really, um, I, I think that's a, poor, a point of emphasis for him. I, I think, you know, in immature spirituality, you know, we kind of know when to avoid difficult situations. But uh, Thomas Akempis is really gearing more towards admonishing people who are avoiding adversity. In... In some sense, it's like, okay, there's adversity in life, um, but if you endure it, you will get spiritual benefits from that endurance. Uh, and this brings him to his long passage uh, uh, passages on, uh, on the cross. Um, Thomas Akempis would say that the biggest cross we have is ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times in terms of, uh, in terms of troubles that come to us, they don't come to us so much from the outside as they come from ourself. Right. And if we try to practice humility and forget about the self and seek God, seek Jesus rather than self, we will find that a lot of the things that we dreaded uh, or avoided uh, can actually become blessings. They mm -hmm. can become opportunities for us. Yeah. Uh, that would be, that would be my take on, on what, uh, Thomas Akempis is trying to get at and trying to e express. And um, don't, don't think that you have to agree with everything that Thomas Akempis uh, <laughs> right. says. Uh, in, you know, in some ways, I liken it to the, par uh, the, uh, the sayings of Jesus in, in the gospel when he says, if your right hand be your problem, cut it off. Well, that's that's kind of extreme hyperbole hyperbole to make a point uh and i think in some ways that's i mean thomas i think should be taken seriously but you know not he's not without um you know excesses you know i think he i think he devalues friendship mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. certainly more than other spiritual writers uh do uh, and, uh, in certain places he talks about despising oneself, mm. which I think is a little strong. Uh, he's not a nature mystic, um, you know, so he doesn't see God in creation. Rather, he sees nature 
has fallen. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot that I would disagree with there. And I think one can, can disagree uh, quite, um, quite honestly and openly. Uh, by the same token, I think his insights, his psychological insights about how we can be our own worst enemy uh, are, are stunning when you consider that they're from 600 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm sorry, were the, did anybody have any questions about the text or, or um, Thomas Akempis before we go into reflection? Uh, maybe that, I know we did that last time. Maybe it's good that we do that at this point. Yeah, Jennifer? I do have one question. I think it's book three. You described it as a long series of exchanges between um, Jesus and the disciple. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the disciple, whether that means a particular disciple that lived in Jesus's time and followed him, or is the disciple supposed to be a general person that we can identify with, that the reader can identify the, with? The second one. Okay. Yes. Uh, really, the, the disciple is, is meant to stand for Thomas and us as well. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Alan, um, this is John. I have a question i guess and, and maybe other people can contribute to this too but trying to understand thomas a, a campus within the um historical period that he lived mm -hmm. um and it, it, primarily 15th century which means that the um inquisition was was probably running strong or maybe I'm not correct I don't know and it was pre-reformation um, it was pre-reformation and pre-inquisition although there's always been an inquisition it's gone by different it's gone by different names okay um but um you know he led a he led a secluded life his uh I think one of the things that we know about him is that he said his friends were books and nooks. Okay. Yeah. But so he was a bookworm and liked to liked solitude. So um, I think that he didn't, I, I think that for him, uh, the, uh, uh, there isn't an indication that political turbulence played a big role in what he did just because of the force of his circumstances. But that's, that's my best guess. That's my surmise. Okay. I'm not a scholar of, yeah. of Thomas Akempis. What religious order was he uh, a part of? Do you know? I do not. Okay. Uh, there was uh there was a reform movement that he was associated with in, in the church, not, not in terms of, of, of uh, Protestant Reformation, but in terms of, of renewal uh, within the church. Um, but I don't, um, but, but frankly, the legacy of the imitation of Christ is kind of, uh, for, for Christianity, I think that impact is more than the movement that he was associated with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very struck by the the passages on about loss of self, which I think you know. So some very very strong mystical leanings, mm -hmm. and um, I've also been reading, or in some cases rereading, some of. Thomas Merton's works and some of these passages about loss of self, you know, almost, I mean, they could have been written by Thomas Merton, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why I think that, that he still, 
Um, you know, like I said, in spite of being having written 600 years ago, the, in many ways he can still speak to us where we are today. Yeah, especially, you know, at least for me, the, the whole thing about how we get in our own way, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that needs to be, a, we need to get out of our way in the sense of losing ourself, you know. I, uh, I, I'm, uh, if, if you get a chance to read Thomas at Campus, I mean, there's, it's sort of packed with a lot of, uh, I could have taken quotes from different, different places, um, because it, the book is really so rich, but what I found extraordinary when I first encountered Thomas at Campus, and that's been influential in my own spiritual life is this dialogue that he has with Jesus. You know, th that idea that, you know, we actually communicate with God and God can communicate with us through our, through our imagination. Um, and, um, and it's very, uh, I think hearing some things as if they were coming from the mouth of Jesus uh, can be very comforting. And I think for the most part, in the imitation, they are comforting. Um, you know, he says, talk to me, um, follow me, you know, I will help you, um, you know, that I'm... Um, I'm more interested in the giver than you, uh, you than I am in the gift. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think of these as things that Christ could easily be saying to you and me, you know, through, through this work, through, through Thomas Akepis. Was there anything else from the handout uh, that that I provided that struck you or moved you or or that you might want to uh, to comment about? I think I missed getting the handout. When did that go to us? Uh, I think that went Sunday. Oh, I'm, I think I must have missed it. Okay. It came from. It came from. Oh, did you, did you register? I, no, I registered, but I, I might have missed the email. That's okay. Oh, okay. Well, if you want, a lot of this talk is on my blog site, alandillingham.com, and you could call it up and scan through it while we're, while we're here, and we can, uh, you know, most of uh, the, the handout was taken from that blog piece. Um, so if you don't have a handout, that could work as well. I find myself feeling a very um, mixture of grief and comfort, probably like the first time I read this and mm -hmm. um, saying, whoa, 40 years, <laughs> my much has changed. <laughs> um, 
but I did find him when I went back to him the first few chapters, I, I found him a little harsher than my faith has developed into, but um, you, you quote, you quoted some things that really were helpful to me. Uh, patient endurance of the world's contempt and contradictions. Mm. Now that's tough when you're a young woman, which I was at the time that I read it and coming from a place of oppression or abuse. Mm. Um, patient endurance, you know, that's not the right message. Mm. And um, it takes a long time. So I, I wonder how this would apply to people today. I mean, I'm in a safe place today, but uh, the world out there, what's going on, mm. how this kind of advice would really apply. Yeah. I am about to make a difficult family visit tomorrow. And that's a place where I'm almost pretty positive I'm gonna be facing contempt and contradictions. Mm. And yet I feel that this is a place where I can freely be, rely on God to help me be humble and patient and just let it pass through me and not react and all that kind of good stuff that I hope I've learned. Mm. But yeah, I'm not so sure how his advice applies always. And now when I, when he says, you know, you only talk to Jesus and only love him. I mean, he was living with a bunch of guys that he probably didn't like. And I can identify with him being a bookworm and everything. I totally get that. But now I tend to see Jesus in the face of everybody, relationships. So I don't want to become detached from that world of relationships. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and yet he said, um, chapter, you go into the love chapters where he's talking to God. And I had underlined this. Um, This is the disciple talking. Let mm -hmm. me love you more than myself and love myself self only for you. I have learned that. Mm. <laughs> you mm. gotta love yourself. Doesn't seem like the right thing to do, but <laughs> I think that's very good advice. And then he says, um, love is prompt, patient, long suffering, courageous and humble. But that has to be coming from a place of security for me, you know, that that you've accepted this love or this source of love, even if you don't call it Jesus. Is real for you. Mm. So I don't know, I'm just feeling sad. Can I say something? Mm hmm. Um, I feel like um, with all this, his talk of endurance and to me, what, what I felt was coming was from Romans where we, where it stated that, you know, not only that we, re we rejoice in our sufferings because with those sufferings, it will produce endurance. We, we, we will be stretched. We will grow. Usually if we think about when we draw closer is when we're at our weakest, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's that point where, we become more humble to the Lord and learning to be humble when we're not, when we're just meek as opposed to weak. And I love how it then goes on and says, and that endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And he has given us how to feel and how to feel God through the Holy Spirit if we go to uh, the fruits of the spirit, you know, love is, you know, uh, it's, it's kindness, it's gentleness, it's joy and choosing that, which is Christ itself over other human things, disappointment. We know the big things, but the little things, those little, cause I feel like he's tweaking those little things, uh, the little disappointments. Um, and to me, that just draws me even closer to, to, to what I think 
I get out of that endurance of that, this constant endurance. And I don't see the suffering in the same way, but it's, it's a different type of suffering. And it's that suffering that we rely on, on the Lord, I think, or, or whatever your higher power is. Um, and I, um, it, it's drawn me closer. So I just wanted to, to share that as a way of looking at the endurance part and uh, really yeah. just seeking into the fruits of the spirit and not get into the human fleshy part, which is other things that aren't of the spirit, which is not of God. Yeah. Um... Uh, Thomas Akempis, you know, like he, like I said, he spent a lot of his time copying Bibles. And if you if you read through the Imitation of Christ, there's a lot of uh, you don't see it so much in in the in the outtakes and the selected passages that I have, but there are many places where he weaves scripture, particularly particularly the Gospels, uh, into uh, into his discussion both in, uh, in the first two books where it's basically counseling um, people who are approaching the spiritual life and in the latter part of the book where he has the dialogue with, with Christ. Uh, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's uh, scripture heavy. And I think, you know, that it reflects his, his job basically copying scriptures. Um, I did notice, you know, some things that were kind of wanting, but I, I think that's part of the part of the fact that he reflects that historic per, historical period and and monasticism, but things like um, social justice, mm -hmm. and I, I think what a couple people have mentioned too about kind of the luxury of coming from a of speaking from a place of safety and security you know um um uh i don't want to say it's, it's kind of almost is uh if I were going to offer some criticism, you know, that he comes, he has the luxury of speaking uh, from a cushy place. <laughs> is, is that mm. the, maybe the way to say it, you know? Um, and um, there's certainly nothing wrong with that but but i i think that you know um the the message is is has some limits to it you know mm -hmm. certainly certainly um certainly i mean one all... should not um with with the possible exception of Augustine, and even there, I think we can we can uh, make some criticism. Um, the 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 mystics and the writers that we'll be looking at are all coming from uh, different places, and I think they have strengths and they have uh, and they have weaknesses too. And for me, what I, what I try to do personally is cherry pick. Uh, I take the things that I think will be helpful to me. Um, and I, 
I, uh, I don't want to say I ignore, but I downplay the rest. Um, you know, like I said, you know, some of it, um, uh, certainly there a great deal of the imitation will not resonate with modern life or modern culture in a way that uh, is not um, uh, you know sometimes it doesn't resonate and that's a good thing sometimes it doesn't resonate and that's not a good thing <laughs> and um, you know, uh, he did write 600 years ago. Um, like I said, he, 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 um, he doesn't really, uh, I wouldn't agree with his view of nature. Uh, you know, it, it seems to be, there, there are some places where he seems to be too much. And one should not take any of these people that we're reading uh, as the truth as the end all be all as un, unchallengeable they're not um but i think that there are rays of light in uh you know that can that can benefit us and even in the dark places we can uh we can be challenged uh by that as well by thinking about where we disagree with Thomas Akempis or Augustine or Francis de Sales, who we'll be looking at next time. Uh, and Francis de Sales, inc incidentally, um, Thomas Akempis would, would be kind of a heavy uh, approach. Francis de Sales is much lighter. He's known as the gentle saint. Uh, he counseled gentleness and patience. Uh, so when we look at him, we'll be seeing a different picture, but they're all trying to serve the same God, trying to approach God. He says such beautiful things that are so contemporary. Give me the grace to recognize my faults and to overcome my passions. I substitute reactivity for mm. passions. Um, I love the quote that you picked for the very last one. I loved all the ones you picked, but about disengaging myself from all inordinate, inordinate love or hatred of any creature. I mean, there's no psychology or whining or anything. You just do it, disengage yourself for that. And sometimes it takes that, mm. you know? I'm just gonna disengage from my anger, my hatred, what I hear on TV or what's going on in the world. There's so much anger and you just have to like, stop it. So in that way, I, I really respect his strength, his strong advice. Yes, it, it, uh, it doesn't come through so much in the passages I selected, but a great deal of the dialogue between the disciple and Jesus is, is the disciple making these very fervent prayers to God uh, for grace. And it's, and it's uh, Christ answering and then his answers leading to more prayer, more and deeper prayer on the part of, uh, on the part of Thomas. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you have read the book, you will see, you will see that. I think Sandy, you're bringing that out uh, very well. It's something that I kind of uh, didn't emphasize in the presentation, but it's certainly there. And if you're looking for that kind of, um, resonance in prayer, you know, I would, I would recommend the, the imitation.
Yeah, a lot of the uh, the, the prayer which the disciple in which the disciple responds to Christ is um, is um, I don't know I, I thought it was very you know kind of beautifully self deprecating you know um, and um, was a real kind of lesson in in humility um and you know and, it, and it, again that kind of ties in with the with the loss of self you know and th those passages and and the some of it too is uh, uh, the passages about love were i think very um almost lyrical some of them um, very beautiful Was there anything else from the from the handouts that struck or moved anyone, or from your own from your own reading of uh, the imitation? You chose, um, I will supply whatever is lacking in you. Hmm. <laughs> Gives me hope. <laughs> Did anyone else have a favorite passage or? Or part of the imitation. Well, I had I had uh, underscored when I read it the uh, this, the lines which you have here because um, I thought it was kind of very. He it, there's not too much as that is kind of like highly poetic, you know. But this this line here was. And the one that you quote, a love flies, runs, and leaps for joy. It is free and unrestrained. Love gives f uh, all for all, resting in one who is highest above all things, from whom every good flows and proceeds. I thought that was just, you know, very, very um, lyrical and beautiful, you know. Yeah, I, I think it's good that Thomas has it in there because it, it, it does, I think, give a balance to the rather heavy emphasis on the royal road of the cross. Yeah. Uh, that if you, if you can see those two together, they, um, you know, it's like the highs and the lows. It's like you can... Um, um, you know, I, I think reading those those two parts together, the part that he has on love and the parts that he has on the royal road of the cross, 
um, really give depth to both parts. Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, certainly somebody leading a monastic life would be inclined certainly to approach love in a in a kind of a mystical union sense. Mm -hmm. But um what I liked about this was that, you know, he was definitely, you know, a, a monastic, uh, an introvert or somebody that, you know, did his thing by, he did his job by himself copying manuscripts, but yet he, he kind of got out of that mold, you know, with, with these beautiful lines about love, you know. Mm -hmm. And it shows, I think, some real um, depth or or um, capability to to see, you know, things in a larger context. And I think that's really something to be said for somebody, you know, that that is not exposed to the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think my favorite passage is where he talks about uh, where, where the disciple is praying and he says, um, whereas by perverse self-love, I had lost myself. Now by lovingly seeking you alone, I have found both myself and you. Uh, and I think that idea uh, that we find ourselves in seeking God and we find God through humility uh, is something, uh, it, it speaks to me and it's something I always have to keep reminding myself. <laughs> And um, it's, I, it's, it's good for me. I, I keep coming back to the imitation um, of Christ when I'm in, in difficult times uh, because it sort of reminds me that. I, Well, we're almost at the end of end of our time. Um, if uh, uh, if if anybody has any pre anything pressing they'd like to say, um, uh, or any uh, any comments that they haven't had the opportunity to make um, so far, um, we can do that now. Otherwise. Um, I can turn it back to Lawrence, who can take it, who's, who's returned to us from, um, from the perils of board meetings. <laughs> the perils of board meetings and uh, <laughs> the Wi-Fi is held out, which is always a good sign right yeah. there too, here at Rolling Ridge. And, uh, and so I thank you all for being part of our conversation this evening. And not just the conversation, but for us to be able to kind of take some space to listen deeply to the voice of the Spirit beckoning us and calling us into that space of love, as, as, as we've been talking about, as we've been hearing about, and recognizing that it is in that space of love that everything that we need will be provided for us, as Sandra reminded us.
And so everything that we lack is ours in Christ. And so as we move into this evening, I send you off with a blessing um, of appreciation for Alan and appreciation for all of you. And so may you go into this evening knowing that you do not walk alone, but that you walk in the footsteps of Christ, who walks with you in love and in grace, and who shows the fullness of the Father's heart for you. May you know that in everything that you need, the Spirit will meet you so that you can live in the fullness of life. Go in the grace of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen. So in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may you go in peace this evening. Thanks for coming. We hope to see you next you. month as we look at The Devout Life by Francis de Sales. Yes, Thank and you as so I, much, as Alan. I as I mentioned before, it's much lighter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I appreciate hearing everybody, what they got, their takes and their comments. It was beautiful. Thank you so much, God. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye, Alan. Bye, John. Uh,